70 bucks for a bottle of wine that you didn't know whether it was good, bad or ugly. So there was just that slot in the middle. Also at the time, there was some, um, I said we were drinking those big fat Chardonnays. At the time, that whole beautiful pan-Asian flavour set migrated to London. And, you know, I still believe there's food in the world in London and that London not only sets drinking, wine drinking trends, but also food trends. And so that whole pan-Asian flavour set went to London, but there was no wine to back it up. You know, the German reasonings were fine, but some of, we just needed some more clean wines to sit behind it. So we just made a wine for that. Um, Kim Crawford, I know Chardonnay is what we started our brand on. And if you think about it, there's no oak. If you, you know, if you drink Chardonnay, it should be like biting into a white flesh nectarine or peach for the first time. You just get a lovely whiff of flavours, and it's and, and that one just sits so beautifully under under that food with those fruit flavours. So that's really how we started. So it's certainly, oh yeah, yeah. Give me another button. Okay. Okay. Here's another button. Much easier. Down. Yeah. Up yeah. and down. Yep. So here we go. Thank you. The next one. Okay. Yep. You see, this is too fancy. We didn't grow up like this. We were sitting, <laughs> sitting on wooden benches at the back. Okay, so this is really the story of the farm boy from T Rail and the sort of and the semi scientist from South Africa, not so sort of. So our experience was kind of far and wide. Kimmy obviously was a farm boy, so he knew farm stuff about lambs and and more importantly, and, and it is quite important because our industry is agrarian. You know, you've got to appreciate that in some seasons it's gonna be boon and as a grower or a, a farmer, you can, you can make lots of money, and then it's going to be the reverse because it's the elements come into play. So I think that was quite important in our business because you had that appreciation of working with the growers. He obviously was a winemaker. Um, I just came out of being a um, medical research scientist looking at the ventricular arrhythmogenesis of human, you know, the heart. I worked for. Um, as a medical sales representative for a year and a half in South Africa, the best thing I ever did for myself. And then came here and, and worked in pharmaceutical marketing, which introduced me to OTC and FMCG. So I always find it a little amusing when people introduce me as a marketer because I'm everything but that. I've done a few courses, but most of the stuff just happened intuitively for us. So, you know, we had the first baby. 40 months later, the second baby. We had three factors. The baby's two, two big gaps. And it was ours just to take that and run with the thing. And at that time, we always thought, well, we're going to be spaceful, so we can have a good time, we can spend time with the babies, we can enjoy love, life, and love. And, and, and But you know what? We always had an exit plan. And it was just on a, um, it was just on a desk pad. Everything is in flow diagrams. But Kim can actually interpret when he hears. I can't. I've got to still see the flow diagram. Biochemistry still is to this day my first love. So here we, here we were. The, um, that's Kimmy on, the, um, on, your, on, your, on your left, and I put him in my neck all skirt, and he did a hock out of my flat for my friends. And we met over that precise bottle of wine at a wine festival in, um, in Cape Town, and I remember asking, I went out the night before, and it was in very late, like five o'clock in the morning, like most of you will do, possibly on Friday night, um, and I had to go to this wine festival early in the morning, and I uh, saw this guy there, and, you know, I was with my childhood friend who went to work with his chap at the, um, at the winery, and, and eventually we started talking, and I said, what's your name? And he said, Kim. I thought, my God, that's fancy, it must be French or something. I said, how do you spell that? And he said, K-I-M. And that was my first brush with a Kiwi accent. So, at the time, you know, something that, that, that Deb and Chris said before, sometimes you don't know what you're doing. You know, you can't plan anything out. We had no money to do research. Sometimes you've just got to take a punt and go. But we knew a few things. We knew that the wine quality had to be absolutely tip-top. We knew that we had to build a brand because we had nothing else really. We knew we had to do some financial planning on a desk pad because we had no money. In our case, those plans needed to be flexible. We needed to change quickly. We had no capital, and again, reinforcing what they said over there, we had an exit plan. We always knew we were going to sell this thing, we just didn't know when. Right? So we invented a model, we just didn't know what we did. You know, first virtual winery, a few guys were dabbling with it before. Of course, we didn't know we invented a new model, it was only when someone described it that it became a model. 
So there you go, that's possibly how things work. So today I just want to talk to you about the existing models in the wine industry, and I think it's pretty much um, applicable to, to a lot of the, the agriculture um, industry, where we have a traditional model. There's sort of since been the emergence of what we call a middle model, the virtual model, which is our one, um, that was very good to us, and where I think the future model is going to be. Um, so that there, of course, is to me doing the harvest, about to plunge the pinot. So being a winemaker is not at all glamorous. It's a pretty physical job. So in the traditional model, right, this is what people have done for centuries and for ages. You buy the land or the vineyard. Now, if you think of Marlborough, you, you know how big is an acre? A rugby field? <coughs> Got no idea. Something like that. You pay about seventy-five to ninety-five thousand dollars just for an acre of vineyard land, or you pay a little bit less, and you spend fifteen thousand dollars a year developing this thing. Then they go and build a winery. Then they make the wine. Then they say, "Hell, I've got to call it something." And, and then they say, they phone you up and say, "Well, I was just wondering if you could help me sell this thing." So then they think of distribution, and then they think of sales. So you know, bottom-up production-driven model. Um, there's still some wine reason, I think, if you're very wealthy and you just want that, you know, ego factor that's still a viable model. It's not something I exclude for, for ourselves in the future, but it certainly wasn't even an option for us when we started. In my view, if I can just speak frankly, oops, there's far too much of an ego factor in that going on mostly. You know, people like to own something and every investor want to say, I've got a bit in that winery, we call it the winemaker's factor. <laughs> and there's a lot of that in our industry. Um, you know, uh, the developers and, and those people have actually put, put wine, uh, land prices out of reach of many, many people who are actually seriously inside the business and not just do it as a toy winery. Okay, so in the traditional model, this owning stuff in a field of factor is really quite important to a lot of people. They want to take their friends there and say, this is my vineyard and this is my wine that comes from that little block. Fine. Uh, of course, it brings tangible assets with it and with that equity. So it's not a stupid model financially. Additionally, you get the full whack, the full margin. So you don't buy from growers and then sell it to a distributor. You grow yourself and then either distribute yourself or sell it to a distributor. So you certainly get the full whack. Something um, that's becoming quite important in, in, I think, all of agriculture is provenance. People want to know, consumers want to know where things come from, who grows it, what does it look like, are they nice, and so on and so forth. You know, there's, there's a case, there's a, a company in Hawke's Bay. Obviously, New Zealand's a sheep farming country, right? So you take a sheep, you cut it in four, and you've got uh, four legs of lamb. It doesn't really matter where they come from. Now Marks and Sparks wants to know it comes from grower A of this paddock, it was slaughtered then, and so on and so forth. So traceability is becoming quite important. People want to know. And generally, of course, for things like wine, which has a whole lot more latitude than other consumer goods, it, it has to have a home. It relates back to that provenance. So you can build a nice cellar door, and people can come and sit there and enjoy a glass of wine, perhaps have something to eat. And that is quite an important, that's a whole different industry, that whole wine tourism thing. On the other hand, it has a very low return on capital expenditure. And if you're just a, vin, uh, you know, 